Thanks very much, Beverly. <clears throat> well, when I was first invited to present this talk um, at this, this meeting, my first thought was to see what I could find on the web about translational models and activities in the field. And the f first result that Google returned was the website for a translational psychiatry conference that was held last year in Austria. And what was the first keynote? A, title, a talk entitled Deep Brain Stimulation in Human Depression, How Can This Inform Animal Research? I gotta say I was a bit confused, but then last week it all became clear. There was an article in the paper about in the increasing rates of um, cats and dogs taking antidepressants. So definitely a victory for translational psychiatry there and definitely a lesson that uh, translational psychiatry isn't only about from bench to bedside. What about the kennel? Um, today, Helen Christensen and I would like to tell our non-linear translational public mental health story. Perhaps the best place to start is at the beginning, or at least one of the beginnings. Um, in 1998, the chair of our session this morning, Professor Beverly Raphael, initiated and chaired a working party uh, to produce Australia's first national action plan for the prevention of mental disorders. And I was the executive editor of that first national action plan and two years before Helen Christensen and I had um, been the writers of the NHMRC clinical practice guidelines um, for depression in young people. And again, Beverly was the chair and, and initiator of that um, particular initiative. Now one of the big gaps um, and action areas that emerged from the National Action Plan was the need for developing means of reaching, engaging with and providing prevention programs for young adults. And particularly young males were, who were at high risk of mental disorders. And at the same time I was doing this, um, my son was attending an alternative school which was teetering on the edge of closure. And day after day I saw the faces of the kids at that school and um, they, if, if they weren't depressed, they were, they were at high risk of developing depression. And I wondered, how, how was it possible to provide a prevention program for these kids um, and for young adults out in the community um, when, well, you know, we knew there were face-to-face -face group prevention programs, but they required people who were, um, who were trained. They required many, so up to 15 weeks um, of delivery. They were typically delivered by health professionals and so forth. And of course, young adults wouldn't have access to them anyway when they were out in the community. And so Helen and I got together and began discussing it. And the internet was really just emerging at that time. And we wondered whether the internet might not be the answer. Um, on the other hand, everybody told us that it would never work as a mechanism. Well, 10 years later, by 2008, we had a global commercialised, in the sense of being funded by government, evidence-based online e-mental health service for anxiety and depression. So today our aim is to just briefly describe how we got from our starting point and our early population trials um, to this global e-mental health service for the public. To do this, I'm going to briefly just describe where we are now in terms of the usage and reach of our service. And then Helen is going to describe the key elements of how we actually got there, ranging from policy, research, trials, technology and implementation. Uh, then I'll talk about lessons learned and finally Helen will conclude with the next steps as we see it. So where are we now? Let's just briefly look at that. We have, um, it's a global service for anxiety and depression, but it's self-help. It's delivered via the web, and unlike most mental health services, it's provided by a university, namely ANU. It's government funded, as I said, it's free to the end user, it's anonymous, it's confidential and accessible to the world um, worldwide, and it now has its own Facebook page. Um, most of you, or many of you, will be familiar with Mrazak and Haggerty's spectrum of mental health care, which broadly um, ranges from prevention through to treatment through to maintenance or recovery. Um, the eHub programs are being used at each of these levels of, um, of uh, spect spectrum of care. So, for example, um, a universal, there's universal preventive interventions going on in schools, there's indicated interventions integrated preventive int interventions going on in places that provide financial counselling for people who are um, having financial problems. 
people are self-prescribing it, general practitioners are prescribing it for treatment, and uh, our peer-to-peer -peer support group helps with the recovery phase of um, anxiety and depression. Uh, eHub Services delivers information, it delivers e-learning programs, and as I said, peer-to-peer -peer support, and it also has a compendium of all behavioural interventions available across the world. Um, it's underpinned by a team of mental health and IT specialists and admin support people, most of um, whom work both in service delivery and research. And a key and necessary, necessary element of the service it, is that it has very strong security and clinical protocols um, and it meets the draft national guidelines for e-health services delivery. So this is a, um, a picture of the um, structure of the service. Basically, there are directors, Helen and myself. Um, we have managers of development manager, IT and clinical services managers, um, and other IT and admin support people. And we have four consumer moderators. They are people who have lived experience of mental health problems. And in fact, a number of us, including myself, are consumers as well as academics or are professionals. And that's a critical element of this particular service. So where are we now? Um, sorry, what about, what, what are the programs that are in, um, that comprise this service? Well, I'm going to only briefly go through these because uh, there are people in the audience who will know them quite well. But the first flagship um, uh, program was Moojim, which delivers cognitive behavioural therapy for depression. Um, it was launched in 2011, and the third version of it was launched in 2008. It currently has 400, the Mark III currently has 450,000 registrants on it, um, 28,000 unique visitors a month, 70% of them for, for, are from overseas and 24% are from rural and remote areas. Now if you want to think about whether this is a global service or not, you can see quite clearly there that um, it's accessed from 203 nation states. The bits in white are the, are the countries where people haven't accessed Mujim. The rest are where they have. It was originally designed for young people as per the National Action um, Plan um, strategy, but in fact, although the peak user group is 25 to 29 years old, you can see there that people of all ages use it. Um, it continues to grow in terms of registrations. Um, 2008, there were 200,000. 200, that's more than doubled to, to um, 431,000 um, in October 2010. Uh, the number of visits per month has grown from 40,000 visits to 50,000 visits in that period of time. Um, originally, users found us via links. This is the worldwide um, way in which users find us. Um, as it's quite interesting, as you can see, that now GPs are the major source of referral to Mujim, whereas it would have been people individually finding it originally. And we think that the reason for that is that the UK has introduced almost a mandatory requirement that people with mild to moderate um, depression should have access to computerised cognitive behaviour therapy. Um, the, the green line is the peaks for media, and that they do correspond to um, articles, for example, in the, in the March 2009 um, Peak, that I think was the Reader's Digest, this one was the New York Times, and definitely we get peaks when we get um, news stories of that sort. That just, um, is just to show that in Australia, the, um, the um, most common reason or uh, uh, referral is from links from another website. eCouch is like the mother of all, um, it was deployed more recently, it's like um, a, a huge, um, number of different MUGIMs. It provides depression, generalised anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder and, and help to specific groups, divorce and separated and bereavement and loss. Um, and each of, the, each of those streams comprises a mental health literacy information stream as well as evidence-based self-help tools. Um, so for example, for depression, there are, the tools are the things we know work out you know, in a face-to-face -face context like CBT, interpersonal therapy, applied relaxation, physical activity, and problem-solving therapy. And we did the same thing for the other conditions, found evidence-based um, 
interventions that worked and put them on the web. Um, in terms of usage, it's only been around a, a shorter period of time, but currently has uh, 26,000 registered users, which is up from 2000 into 2008, so it's growing. 60% um, of the users are from overseas and 22% are from rural areas. At this stage, clinical practitioners don't know about it as much as they know about Mujim, so that's a lesser um, percentage of who comes. Uh, the third program is a peer-to-peer -peer support group called Blue Board, and it incorporates forums for depression and each of the different anxiety disorders. And it's staffed by trained consumer moderators, highly trained, um, under the supervision of a clinical psychologist. And it was launched originally in 2003, but um, had to close down due to lack of resources and is now was launched again in 2008. It has 2,800 registered users, but what's really quite interesting is that obviously a lot of people lurk and read it um, without registering, so it has 80 to 90,000 pages accessed per month. And we also have an information website which provides evidence-based information to consumers, and it has 7,000 unique visitors a month. And finally, we have a program that Helen um, introduced, which I think is fantastic. It's a compendium of all internet behavioural interventions on the web. And it has expert ratings on the evidence underlying those, and it also has um, ratings from consumers who have used those. So now I'd like to hand over to Helen, who's going to talk about how we got there. Um, okay, well, Cathy's already sort of described the policy environment in which we moved from, so I'll jump straight to the research trials, which I think were one of the four important components about actually ending up with a, what we're calling a global health service. Um, I think people often think about our programs as being, um, you know, um, sort of programs just out there for the community, but Cathy's point I think is really re relevant, and that is that we do everything from treatment through to primary prevention. So this was our first study. Um, which was using community people with high elevated baseline symptoms of depression. And we found that um, mood gym relative to a placebo control condition, so not a weightless control condition, resulted in quite a strong effect and that was maintained over 12 months. The effect size there for completers was something like 0.7 and for non-completers about 0.5. Uh, this was our first attempt to fully automatise our research system. So not only did we have an automatic uh, delivery of a computer program, we also automised the recruitment, randomisation, outcome measures and so on. And this was published in 2006, which initially attracted 1,700 people directly just by advertising on, uh, through the web and so on to actually come and do the website. And again, what we found here was that the number of modules that people did made a difference to the level of effect that they got. And this study determined that maybe two modules, or two or three of the modules, were an efficient clinical effect. So it's really a dose response study. Uh, we've done a study in general practice uh, with Ian Hickey, uh, where we introduced Mujim in as an adjunct to what was already being delivered by a sphere trained a general practitioner, so they had training in mental health and found that um, Mujim added to the intervention already provided by the general practitioner. Uh, this is one of our more recent trials where we took the advantage of the fact that there are so many lifeline counsellors out there delivering services directly to people who are what people have called repeat, uh, repeat callers who have anxiety and depression. And what we did was introduce our e-health programs into the Lifeline call centre so that people took the telephone call, people gave up their anonymity and undertook an online um, um, web program. And what we demonstrated in this study, as you can see, is that the internet was the effective component of the intervention. It wasn't tracking by the Lifeline counsellor that led to improvements, or there, were, there were improvements, but they weren't to the same extent, and that the addition of the tracking by the, the Lifeline counsellor didn't add. Um, now, again, this is, this, we were getting effect sizes here in an intention to treat of 0.8. So in a way, it was a treatment trial directed at people who do call Lifeline and in fact have access, do not have access to other interventions. This was a universal prevention program in schools. Um, again, we showed that by giving people mood gym, 
uh, it reduced their levels of anxiety um, relative to a control condition. And we did the same effect looking at depression, and this worked for boys but not for girls. Uh, the number needed to treat was 14. So a classroom of boys, given mood gym, um, the number needed to treat is one in 14. So a classroom of two kids might have reduced uh, depression incidents over a six month period. Um, these were quite exciting to us because even though the effect sizes are small, as you'd appreciate, it's a universal prevention program done in schools by teachers. Um, this is a, another trial that was just completed, uh, an NH and MRC funded one, where we looked at the contribution of the bulletin board in conjunction with the web programs. Um, as you can see there, when we looked at it initially post-test, it looked like the intervention using the e-couch intervention here for anxiety and depression was uh, was effective and that it was the component that was effective. But as you can see, looking at the yellow line across the 12-month follow-up, the board actually ended up having quite a strong effect by itself. And again, I think this is about the dynamics of support groups and boards. Um, and of course, the interaction of an, a web-based program plus a board was, in this case, effective. Uh, this is a study that was done by uh, our US collaborators. Uh, what it was, uh, it was a selective prevention trial. It's known that 25% of uh, doctors going out into the field develop depression over uh, the first six to 12 months. And it was designed to prevent the development of depression in those interns. Um, and the results were quite surprising to me. This is um, mean PHQ-9. The green line is the, the the wait list control group. The red line is the intervention, which was giving them mood gym over four weeks. And the blue line is the intervention for those who completed the program. So this study, uh, which I mean, uh, I was just, the odds ratio there is 3.9. Giving a program like mood gym to medical interns is highly effective in reducing the development of depression in this group. And I have to say, this was done outside of our centre, so we were quite pleased to see an independent replication. This is a study that's currently just finished on the UK National Health Service portal, where people go to the, looking for information. Um, this is a study to see if people going onto the website looking for help would use an intervention like Mood Gym and whether that would lead to increased wellbeing compared to um, not being randomised, being waitlisted to the condition. And as you can see there, this is fully automatised, so there's no uh, involvement by health professionals at all. There was a significant increase in a positive mental health outcome, wellbeing, uh, over the course of the 12-week period. So that is the sort of population-based trials that we've been doing. The technology really was how we got to being able to do these population-based trials. So just to explain the system here, anyone can go to Mood Gym, for example. Um, we upload new information if required, but basically it's just an internet program with a software application behind it. But we can run community trials directly, uh, recruiting people directly from the community or by inviting them through the normal recruitment stages. So you can run open access Try, uh, open access for everybody, plus a number of different trials at the same time. Um, you can also run specific dedicated trials. So currently we might be running four or five research trials at once. And it allows the research managers from the institutions that we collaborate with to download and develop their own research protocols in conjunction with us. But they have access to the data and it's a collaborative experience. So I'm just flicking through a number of the trials that are currently underway. Some of them are finished now. Um, but I think there was something like 25 trials that are happening around, well, in Australia and also internationally, and doing treatment, early intervention, prevention, in a range of settings in, I think, six to eight countries. Um, we also have a translation interface, and it's currently, we've translated into Norwegian, one of the world's great languages, always have to say that. Um, then also we're doing Spanish, Portuguese, Cantonese, Cantonese and Mandarin currently. So how we got there, a final kind of key point, a 
think we've talked about policy, research, trials, technology. The final key point was that we implemented the service before we'd developed the evidence around the service. So it's an interesting idea about the non-linear nature of tran translation. We didn't think the service would provide harm, but on the other hand, we implemented it and started it before it actually was evaluated. Uh, Kathy's going to do lessons learned now, so. Well, one of the lessons we felt that had been learned was that technology is a key to fast translation and fast science. Um, if you think about it, seven years after the product was completed and four years after the first randomised controlled trial of Mujim, the eHub service was funded by Doha and that's really quite a big reduction on um, what is often claimed is the typical 17 year period to incorporate new knowledge into clinical practice. So we think that's an important um, point. But the second lesson that we feel we've learned is that a funding, we need some way of funding um, R&D technology based intervention in Australia. Our original applications um, for funding for our R&D effort were unsuccessful. We applied to the NHMRC, we applied to Rotary. Obviously, people thought this was never going to work. Um, and those bodies are not really set up to fund this type of research, which includes a development as well as a, a, a research component. Um, we were very fortunate. I think Scott Henderson is here at the moment. He was the director of our centre at the time and he gave us some money for a server and um, to, to develop a little bit of a prototype for which we'll always be grateful. Um, and the other thing is that we went begging to the ACT health minister who fortunately had a, a master's degree in public health. Um, he had a, a vision about what he thought health could be in the future and he had some experience personally with contact with young people with depression and he actually gave us the money we needed to to do the development of, of Mergem but you know that's a very hit and miss way of approaching these things. Other countries have funding bodies that will fund this sort of development of technology based interventions. A lot of them have, have, have this to, to a sort of proof of concept um, research approach. And I think we need the same thing, or we think we need the same thing in Australia. In fact, we need the same thing globally. After all, it's, uh, you know, it's people benefit globally from these interventions. It's the world is the beneficiary. Um, the other thing we feel is that new organisations might well be a key to implementation. In some ways, the degree of uptake of the technology by individuals within organisations like general practitioners, um, it, you know, is surprisingly high. But on the other hand, it's very difficult to effect change at a whole of organisational level. And, you know, we found that, for example, working with the telecounselling environment where we know the intervention works in that environment, but you need to actually get it um, implemented in the environment in the long term. Um, so we do need to work out ways of identifying these, the barriers that are stopping this implementation and moving forward with that. But it's also our view that we think that we need, we need to think about outside the old space, basically, um, and establish uh, fund funding mechanisms that will allow the establishment of new organisations, of cutting edge organisations which deliver these new services. Well, another lesson, it's very clear from our experience, is that translation, in public health at least, is, is a non-linear process. Um, I think we think there's a concept of translation as, as, as being a linear process, as evidenced by the phrase from, bre from bench to bedside. But, and, and this um, process sees researchers at one end and policy makers at the other end of the spectrum. That's not how this development occurred. The research process has occurred at all um, points along that sp the spectrum and it continues. Similarly, the impetus for the uh, development was policy and we wrote another a, a policy document in 2002 um, about uh, the policy implications of e-mental health in, in uh, sorry, of e 
health in, in mental health domain. And um, Helen has just written another policy document about the vision of e-health in Australia. We need better ways to conceptualise this non-linear process and to describe what public health translation really means so that what is being done is understood, valued and funded. Most of all, there's a need for us to recognise that translation involves the continued interplay between research, between policy uh, and implementation, all of which are important at different times and all of which are not the sole province of any one particular group of people. Researchers can prepare policy documents, and we do, and you only have to look at Beverly Raphael to, to see an example of that. And um, researchers can provide services, we do, and many others do, and policy makers can undertake research. And I'm engaged with um, some work where I'm involved with policy makers doing research. So what I'd like to do now is to hand over to Helen to describe the next steps. Oh yeah, the easy part, the easy part. <laughs> no, um, I, I think Julia has really described a, a problem, which is that despite the success of our service, which I think is successful, it's clear that providing, implementing and disseminating our programs does not automatically result in uptake by those who might need them or use them. And this mean, the means by which we get people to take up known effective treatments or interventions is probably the biggest translation gap. And in the public health space, I think that's also something that hasn't really been very well considered so far. So we've got these programs, they're out there, but they're not necessarily being taken up. Um, and when you're in the area of health promotion and prevention, the idea that you making people do something that they don't even know they have to do in order to prevent something that's going to happen into the future is very different from telling somebody who's smoking even that they have to stop smoking because they're pretty clear. It's a similar idea, but essentially prevention is about actually preventing something that isn't already causing them some distress. So how do we, what are we going to do next? And I think the next agenda is developing and testing methods to increase uptake of these sorts of programs. And again, I've sort of got four ideas about what might be required for those steps. The first is the consumer input. We really need to know what views and perceptions people have about doing um, pre prevention, um, and in particular areas, and to fully engage with the consumer, because as in most technology projects, you can have great technology and people won't use them. I mean, the second thing is the technology. I think technology is the key to us being able to do really good public health because of the mass capacity of people to be able to use uh, computers. I mean, when you get a computer that's face-to-face -face with you, then it's highly interactive and has many, many features that make it much more likely that you want to engage with it. But I think we have to start thinking outside the box as other people have been doing, not just us, which is how we investigate the use of Web 2, which is essentially using other individuals in a sort of mass persuasion way um, to, be, to start engaging in health behaviours or improving their mental health behaviours. So that's one thing. The use of the Web 2, crowdsourcing, the way in mass interpersonal persuasion is, is one thing that we haven't really really moved into and yet is probably going to be key. But just using technology by itself is not going to be the answer. And what we need to do is use our knowledge of behavioural change to create the technology solutions. So we do have models about how behaviour changes. We just have not really had very good tools about how to actually make that happen. And the work of BJ Fogg uh, from Stanford is particularly interesting in this. He's written a book called Mobile Persuasion, which was very persuasive in its views about how the mobile phone application can do a lot of things. The ways in which text, texts can be used in order to change behaviour. And of course, there's always the robots and the personal coaching kind of mechanism. I mean, I just heard about this robot who recites Shakespeare. I think that sounds rather nice. Better than a friend, really. You can sh recite Shakespeare at you. Um, and this lovely little robot who's got quite a cute face, if you can see him there, perches on the user's shoulder. And uh, the person who this person's talking to through the robot is Skyping into that robot. 
So they're having a little conversation as they're walking along. And I mean, the parallels with what could be done in terms of health promotion, uh, you know, persuading the person not to eat that McDonald's, you know, the whole idea of actually using technology in this broader way is, is kind of potentially interesting area, I think. Now, I couldn't help but put up this picture, which goes 2008 iPhone, 2010 iPad, 2012 iBoard, 2014 iMat, which is kind of a joke. But actually, we may be going that way. We may be having the whole environment being sensitive to what we do and how we act. And, I mean, I know that iMat is probably not going to do it for us, but it's that idea that there is a whole world of technology that can be used to shape our behaviour in this space where we're trying to get people promote healthy behaviour. Okay, final two other areas I think that need to be investigated that we can develop, and that is the concept of financial incentives for public health. I think if you pay people to do uh, prevention programs, they will do them. Um, if you pay $50 to do a six-month prevention program and that actually works, that's very useful money being spent by the government, I think, in changing people and preventing behaviours. And then there's the prescribing and legislation, um, which is another idea where you actually do prescribe people, say, in, workforce play, in the workforce. Uh, one of Cathy's concepts is that people come into a workforce and they have to do a prevention program for mental health. So you're actually prescribing the organisation makes them do it because we know from the evidence that we've got that that actually prevents the development of depression in your workforce. So it, it seems to make sense as well. Okay, so just to conclude, sort of gathering together what we've been talking about, which is this idea, what is public health translation still lost in translation? I know that's a bit of a kind of everyone saying translation, lost in translation. Actually, Julia has called it found in tra translation. But I think our point is that public health translation is lost in translation on many people who don't understand that from public health research, you still have to move into the translation of it. So thank you very much. <laughs>